This is called shike. It's a Korean rice punch. It's one of my favorite drinks. Hey, Geography Peeps. So let's do one more episode of Geography More before the year is over, all right, shall we? So for those of you new to this channel, Geography More is basically when we cover the little extra information that didn't quite make it into the country episodes. Now we cover Belarus, Belgium, and Belize. So for this episode, I actually asked some of you guys, the Geography Peeps from Belarus, Belgium, and Belize to help out. So let's jump back to Eastern Europe and see what Belarus has up its sleeve. <laughs> So one thing I didn't really expound too much upon in the Belarus episode was really explaining the distinctions between Belarusians and Russians. It's kind of sad because a lot of Belarusians don't even know how to speak the Belarusian language since they're just immersed in Russian since childhood. Now, of course, Belarusian is a Slavic language similar to Russian. However, there are some word differences here and there. For example, in Russian, if you want to say, my name is Bob, you would say, Minya zavut Bob. But in Belarusian, you would say, Mianye Klitschuts Bob. In Russian, thank you is Spasiba, but in Belarusian, it's Dziakui. In in Russian, please, is Pajolsta, but in Belarusian, it's Kalipaska. In the video, I talked a little bit about Lukashenko, which, by the way, he calls himself Batka, which means daddy, but I didn't really talk too much about the underlying political scene apart from his rule. Whenever there's a protest in Belarus, the protesters typically use this flag, the white, red, white flag, kind of like an inverted version of the Austrian flag. It was on and off the flag of Belarus before the standard Rushnik pattern flag. Waving this flag in public can get you in trouble. Belarus also has a lot of Uniate churches, which are kind of strange because they're kind of like Orthodox churches, but they recognize the Pope in Rome. Belarus has gone through a lot of turmoil. I mean, Minsk city was kind of destroyed and burned down like 18 times. World War II killed off like a quarter of their population. Those radioactive crop fields in the south put a burden on them economically. By the way, almost every city in Belarus has a street named after Lenin. Now, Belarusian cuisine might look similar to Russian. However, if you look close, they do have their own distinct style and process that sets them apart ever so slightly. First off, they love potatoes. In fact, they love them so much they have like 300 different recipes for potatoes. Second, and traditionally, yeast wasn't used in bread in Belarus. They used their own special type of leaven, which is why Belarusian bread is typically heavier and sour than other breads. Some cool Belarusian dishes include perepecha, which is pancakes made of peas, piachisto, braised ham, filet a la Minsk, and smoked meats are everywhere. Minsk Library, probably the most iconic building in Belarus, is huge. It's 22 stories tall and has 8.5 million books. By the way, they just changed their currency to the new Belarusian ruble, which looks like this. Getting into Belarus is a little bit easier now since the EU lifted a few sanctions in 2015 when they said the presidential election was more transparent than the other ones. This means trade has boosted too. However, sometimes Belarusians will take EU products and then resell it to the Russians under the name of Belarusian product. So then suddenly you have things like Belarusian shrimp, even though Belarus has no access to the sea. Finally, Belarus has quite a few heritage sites, such as the residential and cultural complex of the Radziwill family, the Kamyanets Tower, St. Nicholas Monastery, the Brest, <laughs> breast, fortress, and the palace and park of Gomel. Overall, Belarus is Slavic, but not Russian. All right, moving on. So the Belgium episode was incredibly complex and convoluted with a boatload of political structure info and a lot of the information that I gave is either out of date or it was just kind of wrong. First of all, I mentioned the BHV or the Brussels Alvivold totally butchered that. It's really hard to explain, but it wasn't a French administrative area, but rather a voting district where people in Brussels could vote for French-speaking candidates, which was deemed unconstitutional and disbanded in 2012. In the video, I said Belgium was generally flat, and it is for the most part, but when you go to the south, you hit the Ardennes, which are kind of like, eh, hilly. I mean, we're not talking the Alps, but it is kind of noticeably, you know, not flat. It's hilly. The highest point being Signal de Portrange, which is technically 694 meters tall, but then they added a six meter tall tower on the top to make Make it an even 700. The police in Brussels are federal, not regional, so I got that wrong. Although seriously, who would even take the time to even care about a small fact like that? The Congo was actually a personal property of King Leopold II, and it wasn't until later when the Belgian government kind of put pressure on him to relinquish his claim and then give it to the state. And overall, Belgium isn't as new as I may have portrayed it in the video. I mean, yes, the royal family and the modern generalized construct of Belgium is kind of new, but I mean, Flemish and Wallonian people have had distinct cultures and they've been existing for millennia prior to this even happening. But now, some new info. I can't believe I missed this piece of information because it's so cool, and thank you to Geography Ilias for telling me about this. But right along the tri-point border with Germany and the Netherlands lies this little guy, Neutral Morsnet. Shaped like a triangle, this place was like a semi-quasi-micronation that lasted for like a century. The capital was Kelmis, and they had their own legislative system. You can still see marker stones today on the land area that it claimed. And the coolest thing is that it was the first community in the world that tried to introduce Esperanto as the official language. For those of you that don't know, Esperanto is the world's most commonly spoken constructed language made by this guy in the late 19th century in an attempt to create an easy 
to learn language that could be used universally across the world. Also, fun side note, in 2018, Belgium and the Netherlands will swap some land due to the fact that their border lies on the Meuse River, which keeps changing its direction. Some cool Belgian inventions include the body mass index scale, mainstream commercialized plastic, the saxophone, the JPEG image conversion. Two Belgian priests were credited to inventing neoprene synthetic rubber and discovering the Big Bang. Some Belgian-American inventors include Professor J. De Smet, who invented asphalt, and Karel van de Poel, who invented the electric tramway. Waterloo, the battle that pretty much crushed Napoleon, was in Belgium. Some notable Belgians include Audrey Hepburn, Jean-Claude Van Damme, Love that guy. Artist Jan Van Eyck, Peter Paul Rubens, and Rene Magritte. Love that guy too. Fashion designers Liz Claiborne, composer and singer Jacques Brel, not French, and writer George Simon. Language-wise, the French spoken in Wallonia is different from the French spoken in France, and of course Flemish is a little different from Dutch. The biggest difference for the French in Belgium is the counting system. If you're learning French, you guys will know how difficult it can get when you go past 60. 70 becomes 70, 80 becomes 80, and 90 becomes 80. In Wallonia, they just abbreviate to 70 and 90, although they still use cat vent for 80. Fun little side note, in Switzerland, they use octant for 80, which I personally believe makes things so much easier. Now for Flemish, the Dutch kind of think that Flemish sounds a little too old fashioned, and the Flemish think that the Dutch sounds too rude. The G is hit a lot harder in Dutch, so you would say something like Hudemorge, but in Belgium, you would say Hudemorge. Also in Belgium, the W reverts from a V sound back to a W sound, so in the Netherlands, you would say something like Geweldig, but in Belgium, you would say something like Hewel. Also, Flemish has a little bit of a French influence in it. You can kind of hear it, for example, in words like jam. In the Netherlands, jam is just jam. But in Flemish, it's confiture, uh, derived from the French word confiture, which means jam. Nonetheless, they all understand each other and they love poking fun at each other. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> Now looking back at the Belize episode, there was a lot of cool info, wasn't there? Remember the Black Mennonites? However, there are a few things that I missed out that I kind of want to elaborate a little further on. First of all, of course, English is the official language. However, most people speak English, Spanish, and Belizean Creole, which is not too hard to pick up for most English speakers. You can probably guess what good morning and minemda means. But then you get some heavy, thick words like wait, broke down bridge or danaso daneli so. As mentioned in the video, the Mayan language is spoken, especially in the south where they have about 30 Mayan villages in the Toledo district, right? by Punta Gorda, or the point of the fat one. These villages are kinda hard to get to. I mean, the whole country only has like four main highways, and the villages still have thatched roof houses and women that cook fresh corn tortillas on a hot plate just like their ancestors did. It's a little touristy, but they even offer homestays where you can experience Mayan life. The Toledo district is also known as the Forgotten Land as it is the most untouched, heavily forested area. Many parts of the forest haven't even been explored yet, home to many cat species like jaguarundi, pumas, ocelots, and margues. Now, of course, as mentioned in the video, doing business Business in Belize is very easy, but also so is real estate. This is why Belize is one of the top retirement destinations in the world, especially for Americans and Brits. Orchid Bay in northern Belize is known for being a retirement haven. Most real estate agents aren't even licensed. They just sell houses because the industry is booming. Houses are cheap in relatively safe, quiet, calm neighborhoods and nice, beautiful tropical areas. The exchange rate is always fixed at a two to one ratio for the American dollar. I mean, you may have to deal with the occasional hurricane here and there, but otherwise life is easy and it's good. Fun little side note, you can get close to nurse sharks and stingrays at Shark Ray Alley, and you can witness whale sharks at Plaza Nisi. There are over 500 different species of birds found in the forest, like the Jabiru stork, which is the largest one in all of North America, as well as 500 different species of orchids. Belize is also home to a few mythical legendary characters, like El Sisimito, or the Belizean version of Sasquatch, or Bigfoot. This guy has no knees, his feet are on backwards, and he eats people. There's also El Duende, a one meter tall evil dwarf with no thumbs and punishes kids who kills animals in the forest. I didn't really talk too much about the English influence on Belize. I mean, the Spanish did try to kind of take over, but they didn't really hold on to it very well as Belize was kind of seen as like the back regions. And then the English pirates came in and that just kind of made things even worse for the Spanish. It wasn't until the 18th century that the English came in and officially annexed the area for themselves, calling it British Honduras. You can still kind of see the English influence a little bit in the country though, like in architecture with houses that have open gable roofs and railed balconies. Or in cuisine, they love meat pies and the typical English breakfast is not hard to find. Nonetheless, most food is influenced by Caribbean and Latin American cuisine. Beans and rice with coconut milk, fried jacks, lobster, and plantains are never in short supply. If you come to Belize though, try to find the local delicacy, Gibnut, or the most prized game animal. Gibnut is a jungle rodent, also known as the royal rat because it was once served to Queen Elizabeth. Speaking of which, there are virtually no fast food chains in Belize. No McDonald's, Burger King, Starbucks, KFC, none of that. Thumb locking is a somewhat common greeting in Belize. And finally, every island off the coast, whether inhabited or not, has a government appointed official watchman that stays at a post 
depending on your views on solidarity, it could be probably the most fun or boring job in the world. So there you go, Belarus, Belgium, and Belize, three wonderfully unique countries that we haven't even scratched the surface on. I'm sure there's a lot of information I missed out even in this video, so if you know something about these three countries that I didn't mention, feel free to write it in the comments and teach everybody. That's what we're all about here in Geography Now, okay? We teach each other. So write something down if you know something that I didn't mention. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have some country episodes that I gotta work on. So until then, I'll see you in 2017. Stay cool.